Now you have to forgive my sloppy speech, you know. You get down the south, you forget how to speak English. <laughs> That's one of the requirements. <laughs> now, uh, <clears throat> Brother Modlish been talking about the Word of God. Some of you folks, some of you folks, before this thing is over, uh, you're going to be called a Ruckmanite. Uh, which is a slanderous term applied by apostate fundamentalists who don't have the sense that God gave a brass monkey. <laughs> uh, do you know, if you study church history, you know what you learn real quick? You learn that through the ages, the Catholic Church has always had a way of labeling Bible believers so you think they're a cult. That's standard procedure. You know what they call them back here in the first three or four centuries? They call them Paulicians and Bogomiles and Modernists and Novations and Donatists. Then later they called them Bulgarians, Berengarians, Eukites, Messalines, and they called them in North Italy Fratricelli. Then the Dark Ages they called them Waldensians, Albigensians, Catheri, Brethren, then Hussites after John Huss, Lutherans after Luther, and in my day they were called Norisites after J. Frank Norris in Texas. And you can always spot an apostate fundamentalist for the fact that he'll label a Bible believer as a cult. Amen. That's how you spot him. And that way, when they look back through church history, somebody says, well, we're the true church. We've been called Catholics clear through. That's proof you're corrupt. <laughs> if you've had one name clear through, you're not the church that Christ founded. Because the church that Christ founded is out of fellowship with the world, and the world always labels it as a cult or a sect. Folks worry about me being, uh, people being called Ruckmanites. You ever start thinking how stupid that is? I mean, I bet, I bet any one of you here that got saved, believe that Bible was the Word of God before you met me or heard of me or read one of my books. Uh, I, I, you want to know who the apostate is? I can prove it to you, and I'll prove it to you in, uh, say, 20 seconds. Okay? The man that led me to Christ on the 14th of March, 1949, was Hugh Pyle. And the first thing he said to me in the record room of the radio station where he led me to Christ was, Do you believe this Bible is the Word of God? And took it out of his pocket. And I said, Yep, that's it. Now, it's 31 years later. And if you took out of your pocket the Bible he took out of his pocket and said to me, Do you believe this book is the Word of God? You know what I would say? I would say, Yep, that's it. <laughs> I haven't changed my position in 31 years. And not about to change it. Now, if you find somebody else who thought that was the Word of God when they got saved and changed their mind, then they've fallen away, not me. Amen. Not me. All right, now we're going to talk a while this morning about uh, one of the greatest things in the Word of God and one of the main teachings of the Word of God. And this subject is, Where Did the Dead Go? What happens to a person when he dies? Now, I say that's one of the main teachings of the Word of God, because after all, the Bible is the only book in the world that can let a man know for certain what's going to happen to him when he dies. Now, maybe you never thought about that, but do you realize that every religion in this world has some doubts about life after death? Uh, you take Mary Baker Eddy, she was certain she was going to be all right when she died because there wasn't any death. <laughs> And Mary Baker Eddy, there wasn't any sin, there wasn't any death, there wasn't any heaven, there wasn't any hell. So when she died, she said, put a telephone in my tombstone, in my tomb, because I won't really be dead, I'll phone back. <laughs> well, why put it in the tombstone if you're not going to die? Why don't you just leave it in the living room? <laughs> I mean, uh, people, there isn't any religion that gives assurance of salvation except the Bible. A Bible believer is the only person in the world that knows absolutely for certain what's going to happen to him when he dies. Now, if you're a Buddhist, you know what you believe? You believe in following the Noble Eightfold Path and getting rid of your karma and sitting cross-legged, you get enlightenment, and you can call it progeny in India or call it uh, samadhi or nirvana, whatever you want to call it, but you believe that after several thousand reincarnations, you might reach the ultimate, see? There's no assurance. You don't know that you will or when you will. If you're a Roman Catholic, you don't have any certainty for sure. You can try to fool me and pretend like you do, but you don't. For example, if you're a Roman Catholic and I said, how do you know you're saved? You couldn't pick up any book in the world and show it to me. All you know is your personal opinion. It isn't even worth considering. I won't even ask your opinion. If you're saved, you're saved according to what God said or what he didn't say. Amen. You're not saved according to what you think. I could care less what you think. Anybody fools with you. That's the trouble with this country. What do you think? What do you think? Who cares what you think? I mean, what did God say? 
Now you take a Catholic, you, uh, you hope for the best. I mean, you hope you'll land in purgatory instead of hell. And uh, you believe you uh, join the church that Christ founded and take the sacraments, you might make it. You don't know for certain. If you say you do know for certain, you're just kidding yourself. The Catholic Church doesn't teach you can know for certain. And if you know for certain, you're a bad Catholic. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. I tell you, I believe, a, I believe a lot of Roman Catholics are saved. I really believe that. I'm a lot more liberal, liberal than some of the brethren. I believe a lot of Catholics are really saved. Of course, they don't know it, and they can't enjoy it. <laughs> and they weren't saved because of the church. They were saved in spite of the church. Amen. The Roman Catholic Church doesn't teach you to know for sure you're saved till you're dead. Now, if you're a Protestant, you're not going to make out much better. Uh, Catholic, Evangelist, like they say overseas, they uh, try to keep the Ten Commandments, do the best they can, hope for the best. Uh, there's only one person that can look God in the face and say, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. There's only one kind of man that can look God in the face and say, uh, to depart and be with Christ is far better. And that's a Bible-believing Christian. You take Confucians, they, uh, they hope for the best, but they don't know for sure. Now, in the Word of God, you can know. I talked to a colored boy about his soul down south one time, and I was trying to get the point across, and I said, well, it's, you die, and then, then, then what happens to you? And he said, well... Uh, he said, they bury you, don't they? <laughs> yeah, they do that. They bury you. Uh, Job says, man wasteth the way, giveth up the ghost, and where is he? Job says, if a man die, will he live again? Those are two great big questions. If a man die, shall he live again? And a man wastes away and give up the ghost, and where is he? Well, he's somewhere. He's somewhere. Trouble is, you have a bunch of people who don't know the Bible. They're ignorant of the Word of God. Uh, there's a vast ignorance over the whole world. They're ignorant of it in Germany. I've been over there. They're ignorant of it in Hawaii. I've been over there. They're ignorant of it in Japan. I've been over there. They're ignorant in the Philippines. I've been over there. They're ignorant of it in America. American is probably the stupidest of all for the opportunities I have. Um, you take the average 10 Americans with a college education, ask, uh, ask them to name six apostles. They couldn't name fair life dependent upon it. One of my friends witnessed to a Jew up in Memphis, Tennessee, and he said, I believe in keep, keeping the Ten Commandments. And this Christian woman was a wise woman, and she said, go on, you don't even know them. And he said, of course I do. She said, name them. <laughs> and he got to the first three, and then he stopped, and he said, yeah, I see what you mean. <laughs> I mean, there are very few people who can name the Ten Commandments. I bet there are not five people here that can name them in order. Bible blockheads. That's the problem. I mean, even in fundamental churches. Uh, I've got a story about a colored fellow who wanted to be a Presbyterian minister. And he came up for the board and they, and they said, Brother, Brother Roosevelt, do you believe that Bible? He said, I believe that Bible from Generation to Resolution. <laughs> and they said, well, what's your favorite story in that there Bible? He said, my favorite story in that there Bible, that there story, that there good Samaritan. And they said, well, would you mind telling us that story so we know that you know that story? And he said, of course not. So he began. He said this. He said, there was a certain man who went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell amongst the thorns. And the dun sprung up and choked him a thousand fold. And he was lying there long come Jehu in a chariot and pick him up. And as they was riding under Jupiter tree, he done caught his hair in the branches thereof. And Delilah come down with a pair of shears and clip him down. He fell upon the stony ground and look up over his head and see the cloud about of a mile size of a mustard seed. And it rained 40 days and 40 nights. So he went into a cave where the ravens brought him quail in the morning, man in the afternoon. And when he come out, there was a river so great that no man could cross it. So he passed by on the other side. And as he come down to Jerusalem, he see old Jezebel sitting up in a sycamore tree. And he said, some of you birds up there chunked that old gal down. So he pick her up and they chunk her down. He say, pick her up and chunk her down again. So they pick her up and they chunk her down to 70 times 7. And the fragments, what remained was 12 baskets full, including men, women, and children. And the question I want to ask you, Jim, and the Presbyterian is this, whose wife she going to be in the day of judgment? <laughs> now, you know why some Christians don't think that's funny? Because <laughs> they don't know whether it's so or not. That's right, brother. That's right. That's right. 
You know, I, I had a meeting one time up in Cincinnati and gave that thing. A couple of people down there just sitting the sober as a judge. One, I remember a couple of three minutes would say, Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right, now, if we're going to find out what has to happen to a man, we've got to know what a man is made up of. A man has a body, he has a soul, he has a spirit. Paul says, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved uh, blameless under the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Favor he calls you also will do it. Now, those words in Greek look like that. You don't have to know Hebrew or Greek to know they're different, but I'm going to put the Hebrew and Greek up here so you'll see they're not the same word. That word for body in Hebrew looks like that, flesh, basar. That uh, word for uh, uh, soul or spirit looks like this, ruach. That word for soul looks like this, nephesh. And these uh, words here, well, you don't have to know Hebrew or Greek to know that. They're just, you, you know how you know those words aren't the same? Because they're spelled different. <laughs> See? But you got a body, and you got a soul, and you got a spirit. Now you take Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died in Calvary's cross, and when he died in Calvary's cross, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my what? Spirit. spirit. Okay, spirit went up. Where'd the spirit go? To heaven. That word in Greek looks like that, uranos. That word in Hebrew looks like this, shemayim. His spirit went up. Where did his body go? You know where his body went? His body went down the tomb of Joseph Arimathy and lay down there three days and three nights. Where did his soul go? Take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 2. Nothing like a King James Bible clear up a college education. Amen. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Along about verse 27, verse 31. If you've got a new Bible, you won't find this in it. If you've got a King James, you'll have it right. On right, Acts chapter 2, verse 27, down there in 31. Doesn't it say his soul was not left in hell? His soul was not left in hell. Neither did his flesh see corruption. All right, Christ's soul went down through hell. Where is hell? It's down. How do you know it's down? Take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 12 and look at verse 40. Get Matthew 12, 40 in one hand, get Jonah chapter 2 in the other. You see, the Bible is a textbook on life after death. It's the only scientific textbook in print. You hear folks say, well, the Bible's not a textbook on science, but where it speaks of science, it speaks accurately. That isn't true. The only accurate textbook on science that ever been, has ever been printed is the Bible. Amen. How do you account for the fact the Bible has never had to adjust one word to any science since the foundation of the world? I'll tell you why it hasn't, because it's the scientific textbook. <laughs> and once in a while they catch up with it, and once in a while they don't. Now, when a fellow says science, he means the physical science, you see. I grant you the Bible is not a detailed encyclopedia of facts that deal with all the physical scientists, but if it would be, it wouldn't be worth buying. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now you take Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so must the Son of Man be three days and three nights where? Where? There isn't any question about where it is, the heart of the earth. How do you know where Jonah was? Turn to Jonah and get Jonah chapter 2. Watch old King James the translator take that word Sheol and translate it just like it ought to be translated. Amen. Jonah chapter 2, verse 2. There's old Jonah crying out. Jonah 2, verse 2. What does he say in Jonah chapter 2, verse 2? Out of the belly of what? What? Hell. In hell. Hell's in the heart of the earth. Christ said, as Jonah was three days, three nights in the belly of the whale, so must the Son of Man. Oh, Jonah's body is not whale, but his soul is not there. Now, there's an old boy that went to hell and back. All right, down there, this place is called Sheol, like that. It's under your feet. According to the New Testament, there are two places in it. There's a place called Hades, translated as hell in the New Testament. There's a place over here in the Old Testament called Abraham's bosom. And when Christ died, his spirit goes there, his body goes here, and his soul goes here. He can divide body, soul, and spirit. All right, his soul goes down, down to here, in this part here. Let's take an Old Testament case. I'll let this black figure represent an unsaved man before Calvary, and a red figure represent a saved man washed in the blood. Now, that isn't racial discrimination. I mean, I just have to draw it. I'm, how are you going to draw it? <laughs> you know, these fellows start all this discrimination and stuff. They sure messed up us artists, didn't they? 
I mean, the idea of saying black and white are the same. They're not the same. Amen. You, you're, you're a cuckoo if you think they're the same. You know something? You're demented if you think they're the same. You see that? That's white. You see that? You see that? That's black. Is there a difference? <laughs> now, if you don't think there is, you're nuts is your problem. Why, you're dangerous, man. I wouldn't trust you out in the street driving a car. If you can't tell green from red, what you doing driving a car? Bunch of folks colorblind. Some of you anchors already upset. Settle down, kid. Suck your bottle. I mean, Mom will change your pin in a while. <laughs> Now listen, a man that doesn't think there's a difference between races is demented. As far as I'm concerned, if a man is not a racist, he's crazy. You know what the NACP is? That's the National Association for the Advancement of One Race. It's a racist outfit. Color people. He said, you go talking like a southerner. Now, don't give me a hard time. I've got saved colored people down there that love me, and I love them in the Lord. And if a colored fellow is saved, he's my brother in Christ. Amen. I understand that perfectly. And if a colored woman is saved, she's my sister in Christ. Amen. I get sick and tired of some of you Yankees always worrying about our southerners down there. Let me, let me tell you something. When you, when you talk to us about this stuff, you bring a few of your colored converts with you when you come, okay? Amen. If you love the colored people, win them to Christ. Amen. You love them. I've got a colored lady been working me for 18 years. She, she's a good a Christian anybody in this town. That woman loves the Lord. When she gets sick and goes to the hospital, I go and visit her just like I do my regular church members. And she give me a hard time. So you hate colored people preaching against No, sir. No, sir. But I got enough sense to know that one color is not like another color. You see, I paint. <laughs> and if all the colors are the same, I'm wasting my time. <laughs> I mean... They're not the same. Now, some of you bigots, some of you prejudiced, narrow-minded bigots up here, so narrow for fly aside, you know, they kick you in both eyes at the same time. I mean, some, some of you bigots, before you go on to say, well, Southerners, Ku Klux Klan, white supremacy, and all that stuff, I don't believe in white supremacy. See? Now, you, you, you're not going to mess me up. I believe in Jewish supremacy. How about that? <laughs> if there's such a thing as superior race, it's Shem. Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, not Japheth. See? But what are you going to do? You're going to paint a fellow on the say, What color do you paint him? Green? <laughs> go out there, go down there and see a sign down that says, Black is beautiful. I never heard of such racial inflammatory stuff. <laughs> Black is. How come you never see a sign saying white is beautiful? I mean, I like white myself. <laughs> you say why? Because I'm white. <laughs> I mean, I mean, God forbid I should ever see the day I go into a drugstore and get arrested for ordering buttermilk instead of chocolate milk. <laughs> You know, you know, I'll get back to this in a minute, but you know, but you know, you know, when I was a boy, when I was a boy, we had a book, and it was called Little Black Sambo, and he was black, I mean black, just as black as shoe leather, man, and a little black mumbo, and a little black jumbo, and a little black dumbo, and a little black sambo, and I went in a restaurant downtown the day, it was called Sambo's, and he wasn't black. <laughs> He kind of bleached out somewhere. I don't know what in the world happened to him. When I was a boy, we had a little book called The Ugly Duckling. Now, he's black. He's just as black as patent leather, man. And then one day he turned into a beautiful... <laughs> this isn't Chamberlain Wagner, brother. I mean, this is just, you know... And, uh, and, and he was a, a black duckling, and then one day he turned a beautiful white swan, you know. And my kid bought home a book the other day with Ugly Duckling in it. He wasn't black anymore. He's ugly, but he wasn't black. He bleached out, gone through the Clorox or something. I don't know what it is. You know it's a shame when you lose your sense of humor. Do you know that? Now, for the colored person here, I preach this in, mess, in sermon to colored people there. They laugh, just have a good time. You know what a colored person gets to say? They appreciate a joke on themselves. You know that? If you can't appreciate a joke in yourself, there's something wrong with your religion. You are not that dignified. 
Now, now I know I'm juvenile, so I know that. I mean, I'm, you don't have to rub it in. I mean, I know I never grew up, you know, and I, and I never will. <laughs> My wife says to me, what are you going to be when you grow up? I tell them I'm going to be a hockey goalie. <laughs> But I, I know that, see, I know I'm, I know I'm very juvenile, and I, I know I have a way, you know, kind of irritating folks my age, because I'm not my age, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> but let me tell you something, let me tell you something. I don't care if you're 50, 60, 70, and a banker, a doctor, a lawyer, you are not so uppity up that it is something about you that's ridiculous. Amen, 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 and amen. I bet if I had a motion camera of you since the time you got up this morning, you'd look rather undignified sometimes. <laughs> yeah, boy. Yeah, man. Amen. You know, that's the trouble with these Americans. They take themselves too seriously, man. You ain't that serious. I tell you what serious is the Lord and that book, brother. And the rest of it, uh, easy come, easy go. <laughs> All right, anyway. Now, you take this figure here. On the save, this fellow say. Now, what happens to him? All right, there was a certain rich man clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. There was a beggar named Lazarus, laid at the gate of the rich man's his house, covered with sores, his iron be fed with crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. More the dog came and licked his sores. And it came to pass the beggar died and was carried by the angels of Abraham's bosom. All right, went down here. How do you know he went down there? Because they said the rich man also died and was buried and then hell, you know what that is, he lifted up his eyes and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. All right, then Abraham's bosom is a figurative expression. It's an expression where they indicate a place where saved Old Testament Jews went when they died. I mean, God gave the earth to Abraham, Romans chapter 4. The promises were to his descendants. So that's a picture of a saved Old Testament Jew. That's an unsaved Old Testament Jew. This fellow went to hell. And when he got to hell, the Bible said, he said, I am tormented in this flame. He was burning. the fire in hell. A bunch of folks run around saying, hell is the grave. Well, what a cockeyed thing, man. Why, there's no fire in the grave. Somebody said, well, that's the final fire. No, it's the final fire. The rich man was burning a thousand years before the final fire ever showed up. Matter of fact, he'd been burning now nearly 2,000 years. That isn't the word for grave anyway. That word for grave in Hebrew looks like this, keber. And sometimes you find the plural on it, keberim. You never find a plural in sheol. The Bible doesn't speak about sheols. There's only one, there's only one sheol, the thousands of graves. You take that word in grave in Greek, looks like this, Nehemiah. That isn't the word for sheol. Sheol are the place of the part of the spirits. They're not the same. You say, how do you know you're not the same? They're not spelled the same way. <laughs> See, that's G-R-A-V-E-H-E-L-L. <laughs> I mean, what if I came to your house with a bunch of records, you know, on a watchtower and sat down there and said, the only light bulb is the cat. And you said, what? And I said, the only rug is the stove. And you said, what? And I said, the only car is the sofa. You think I was ready for the funny farm, wouldn't you? Um, you think I didn't have a full deck, man, if I came and talked that way? And yet the people talk that way. And some of them are good folks. I mean, they really are. Some are nice, good, fine, sweet, clean, wonderful Nuts. <laughs> I mean, they're nice, sweet, fine folks, but they're cuckoo. One of my people down there had a, was talking one of those no hellers, and when, and my, one of my people are kind of crude, you know, they're not tactful like me. I mean, I got, I got some, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not kidding, I got some guys following me, make me look like a liberal. I'm going to Catholic church, you know, and turn the statues upside down, all that kind of thing. Man, blow out the candles, you know, all that kind of thing. And, 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 and one of them talking to this J.W., and by, he kept saying the grave is hell, and one of my students said, boy, I sure am sorry to hear that. And the J.W. said, why that? He said, boy, if I'd known that, my, that I'd have hung my sister on a tree after she died. <laughs> and he said, what, what? He said, well, if the grave is hell, I wouldn't want my sister to go to hell. I'd just hung her on a tree, you know. I'm, well, <laughs> crude thing to say, man. <laughs> But I mean, you stop to think about it. Is Dwight L. Moody in hell? Is Paul in hell? Is Matthew in hell? Is Mark in hell? Why, if the hell is the grave, they all went to hell when they died. 
you ever hear Paul say, I just can't wait till I get home to hell? <laughs> well, listen, why Paul said, for, for to me to live with Christ to die is gain, gain, gain. It ain't gain to go in a hole in the ground. He said, I have a desire to, to, to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. He said, when we're present in the body, we're absent in the Lord, absent in the body, present, uh, present with the Lord. And he said, uh, we're confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent in the body, to be present with the Lord. You think the Lord's in the grave? <laughs> Folks are weird, boy, they're weird. All right, the fellow dies, he goes here. Saved man dies, he goes there. Why does he go there? Well, you know why a saved fellow goes there? He couldn't go to here, he couldn't go to hell, he's saved. He couldn't go to heaven if his sins hadn't been paid for. He couldn't go to purgatory. Because there isn't any purgatory. <laughs> purgatory is one of those words that had two different spellings, you know. B-A-L-O-N-E-Y, purgatory. <laughs> That's right, brother. Next time you go to delicatessen, tell them you want a purgatory sandwich with mustard on it. All this nonsense. You know what that Bible says about purgatory? That Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, Christ, after he himself had purged us, purged us, purged us of our sins, sat on the right hand of God. I have to go through purgatory. The Lord's already been through it for me. But that Bible says, Hebrews chapter 9, how much more should the blood of Christ purge, purge, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Fire can't purge you. It'll take a blood purge. The blood of Christ. Or oh, in the Old Testament, the fellow went there. Why? A salvation wasn't complete. His sins hadn't been paid for. You hear these stupid college professors saying, well, Ruckman's a heretic. He teaches, you know, folks weren't saved in the Old Testament like they're saved in the New Testament. Of course they weren't. They didn't even go to the same place. Are you trying to kid your mother? All this stuff, they, they're saved the same way. Why, of course they weren't. If they were saved the way, same way, how come they didn't go up the same place? I grant you in the Old Testament, for the law of man is saved by grace through faith. I grant you under the law of man is saved by faith and works. I grant you that grace is manifest everywhere. I don't teach you any time that God didn't manifest grace. If it weren't for the grace of God, nobody would be saved. I grant you that. But if you talk about method and way, listen, Abraham got saved. He wasn't spiritually circumcised. He wasn't adopted. He wasn't regenerated. He wasn't born again. He wasn't in Christ. He wasn't part of Christ's body. But he was saved. Amen. All right, now Christ shows up. What does he do? He dies on the cross. He says, it is finished. What's finished? Redemption. Salvation. It's complete. It's all finished. That's the hardest thing you have getting across to a Catholic. The hardest thing a Catholic ever had to learn is that when Christ died, that's it. Amen. I mean, I know how it is. When you're brought up that way, it's hard to get used to it, you know. You keep thinking, well, that just couldn't be enough. I just must have to do this and do this and do this and do this. I've seen Catholics after they were saved go back into a Catholic church just for a visit and just unconsciously dip the water, you know, before they went in. After they were saved. You know, some of you people don't understand that, but, but we ex-Catholics, we understand it. Well, you've been raised in the fall system for 27 years. You don't come out of the bushes overnight. It takes a little while. And, 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 and no Catholic, he appreciates, so you know. Did you ever meet a fellow sound asleep that appreciated being kicked to get woke up? I have people tell me, well, Ruckman, you'd, you'd win a lot more if you were a lot sweeter, you know, and weren't so angry and fierce and furious with them. I never let a Catholic the Lord in my life who didn't get mad first. And then he got scared. And then he got saved. <laughs> I mean, if a fellow is sound asleep and you come along and say, boy, <clears throat> get up, he didn't want to get up saying, thank you, I should appreciate that. <laughs> All right, Christ comes along, dies to a sin, and is buried, and the third day he comes up from the dead. What does he do? He dies, he goes down through here. You saw, well, it wasn't uh, actually just hell, it was, it was hell. These bunch of apostate fundamentalists teaching he didn't go through hell. Question, if he didn't go through to hell, then what did he do with your sins? Doesn't the Bible say he became sin for us? Doesn't the Bible say he bore your sins in his own body on the cross? Doesn't the Bible say God made him become a curse for us? For it is written, curse is everyone that hangs on a tree. What did he do with your sins? He dumped them right there. You know where sin winds up? It winds up in hell. What that Bible says? That Bible says, Unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. 
That's changed the new Bibles. You know what those new Bibles are for? They're to cover up the truth and prevent you from finding what God has for you. All right, goes down through there. Dumps the old Apostles' Creed used to say that. Some of you maybe remember the Apostles' Creed from years back. They used to say, he descended into hell. How many remember that? Let me see your hands. They've even taken that out of the Apostles' Creed now. Well, that was a true statement. They should have left that one in. <laughs> oh, he descended. Never could get it right. <laughs> descended into hell, went through here, then he went over here. I don't teach he made an atonement there. I teach he made an atonement there. I don't teach he suffered in hell there. He suffered in hell there. I got the thing right. There's no heresy. I understand when he says it is finished, the atonement is complete. I understand when he says, I thirst, he's suffering what a man would suffer in hell. I understand when he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's what they say in hell. The atonement is complete there. He doesn't go there to burn. He goes there to dump the sins. Now, that's what they did in the Old Testament. They put them on the scapegoat, and he went off in the wilderness and dumped them. All right, now he goes over here. What does he do over here? Well, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 19, get that in one hand, and get 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 6 in the other hand, and then with the other hand, pick up Ephesians chapter 4, <laughs> verse 8. <clears throat> Ephesians 4, verse 8. Nothing like a Bible to clear up a seminary education. Notice you're getting this out of a, that old archaic Elizabethan English that nobody can understand. <laughs> we had a lady come to Pensacola one time. She was a Swiss doctor, and she was an expert on dying. And all the nurses in the hospitals had to all meet together and hear a lecture on, because she's an expert on dying. She's supposed to attend to more deathbeds than anybody in the world, I reckon. And that female Swiss doctor got up for 300 nurses. My wife was one of them. And in that crowd, there were maybe 100 saved nurses. And right in the middle of the question and answer period, some saved nurse said, well, when they're dying, what are we to tell them about hell? <laughs> you know, one of those blunt questions, you know, of some new babe in Christ. And that Swiss doctor got that mic up by her mouth and just screamed over that thing and said, don't ever talk to mouth hell. There isn't any hell. <laughs> and 200 of those nurses applauded when she said that. So you better get saved before you get in the hospital. Amen. Now, do you think I need some silly idiot coming over from Switzerland and talking to me about life after death when I've got a book written by somebody who died and was buried and came up? <laughs> Christians are the strangest people to go out and buy these little books, Life After Life, you know. <laughs> oh, gee, you know, oh, passing out and coming in. Listen, half those people you're reading about, there are on drugs. When they get to the hospital, they'll shoot you full of dope. Is any junkie in this town? Some of those people are tripping in, tripping out. Some of those people having comas and cataleptic seizures and the heart is stopping and starting again. You can't go by that. Amen. You better go by the book. Amen. There's a doctor in Memphis. He wrote one. I forget what it's called. Anybody got that book by that doctor from Memphis? He wrote one to counteract that life after life. You don't hear much about it. And I've forgotten the name of it already. Anybody got that book? Well, he got, he got his book on what happens to folks in the die, because he had some of his patients die on him and come back. You know what he did? He got saved. You know how he got saved? He was working on a guy that went in those cataleptic seizures, and his heart would stop, and he'd work on the guy would come back. When the guy would come back, he was sweating. And when he'd come back, he'd say, hold me, hang on me, hold on to me, hold on to me, hang on me, and then he'd go out. And then about 10 minutes later, he come back and says, My God, don't let me go back. Don't let me go back. Keep me out of there. There are red snakes down there. Keep me out. And then he go back. That'd shake up your day. <laughs> and that doctor got saved. All right, now you take Christ, dies on the cross. He goes down through here. Now, if you've got your Bible open there, get Ephesians chapter 4 and look at verse 8. For by when he ascended on high, led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto man. Now he that ascended on high, what is it? But that he that also descended into the lower parts of the earth. See that? So Christ went down through here and through here and took some captives captive. They were somebody else's captives. And he, got, he stole the POWs and took them out and didn't burn a helicopter while he was doing it. <laughs> All right. All right, now you take, now you take, 
Now you take First uh, Peter chapter 4 and look at verse 6. First Peter chapter 4 verse 6 and First Peter 3.19. Two preachings. One of them is the gospel, one of them isn't. All right, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 6. For this cause was the gospel preached to them that are dead. Right there. The gospel was declared to them that were dead. That thou might be judged according to man in the flesh, and live to God according to the Spirit. All right, now you get 1 Peter chapter 3, 19. Jesus Christ, after he died, went by the Spirit and preached the spirits in prison. Down there. Now, I didn't say gospel. That's two preachings. Comes down here, says, you fellows trust the blood to save you? Nope. Well, your doom is sealed. I'm the lamb that taketh away the sin of the world. Your doom is sealed. You're going to come at the judgment day. Bam. Slam the door. Lock the door. Push the key on the girdle. Revelation 1. The keys of death and hell. You understand there's a gate there? The gates of hell, you got it? I mean, you get it after a while. The gates of hell, you understand it? Jonah and hell, the earth with its bars, bars, was a lot. See, I mean, uh, nothing like King James Bible Crypt commentary. <laughs> so he shuts this thing, locks the door, steps over here, opens this one. You fellas waiting for a lamb to show up? Yeah, I'm the lamb. Let's go. Out to go. <laughs> Locks the door, puts it around his girdle. Amen. I am he that liveth, was dead, and am alive. Amen. Had the keys of death and hell and live forevermore. That's the one. Amen. All right, you know what that's like? That's like going to penitentiary and telling a bunch of fellows over here, your execution date is fixed. You get the hot squat on the 15th of September, whatever ever it is. Bam, you slam the door. You step over here, you fellows waiting for your pardon from the governor. Here's the pardon. Out you go. That's the difference. When Jesus Christ finished his blood atonement, he went over there and took those occupants out of that place there and took them up to heaven with him when he rose from the dead. How do you know that? Turn to Matthew chapter uh, 27 and look at verse 50, 51, 52. Matthew 27. Matthew 27, verse 50, 51, 52. Now it's talking about the events that took place around the crucifixion. And he says in Matthew chapter 27, along about verse 50, 51, 52, the veil of the temple was rent in twain, the top to the bottom. There was an earthquake, and the rocks were rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints, what verse is that? 52, and many bodies of the saints that slept. You see, the body sleeps. It isn't the soul. There's no soul sleep to it. And the bodies that slept, or, you know, Paul says, those that are asleep in Jesus, Amen. he's talking about the body. The bodies slept, arose, keep on reading, and were seen in the city following his resurrection. Saturday night after 6 o'clock, they came up. So when Christ comes up, somebody comes up with him. Now, double check. The dying thieves on the cross, and they're making fun of Jesus Christ. And suddenly the dying thief turned to Jesus and said, Lord, remember me when thou comest thy kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. But he couldn't get up here. The Lord hadn't gone up yet. He said, You'll be with me. Where was he that day? He was down here. So in the Old Testament, paradise was down there. Now, I, I have some of the brethren that have been going a little further in their Bible studies than I have have been telling me different things about You know what's amazing when a fellow learns that King James Bible he begins to believe it and gets to digging in it? I've got a brother up in, uh, up in uh, Ohio, or down Ohio from here, I reckon, and, and in Ohio, and he's uh, telling me that when the Antichrist shows up, he'll be Judas. I mean, he says that Judas will show up as the Savior and say, I'm, I tried to save you and tried to help you out. He wouldn't listen to me. I thought to myself, boy, that's wild. But I got thinking about the thing. I thought to myself, isn't that strange? Why wouldn't they trust the villain? They did Barabbas. They said, let Barabbas go and crucify Christ. Maybe the hero in the next 20 years will be the most wicked man that ever lived. And I don't know that so, see. But these guys, when you get them in that Bible, they begin to study it and pretty soon they begin to find things. You know, a fellow told me recently, come to think of it, it was Perkins. Is he from Auburn, New York? Yeah. Well, I was sitting eating with Perkins, and Perkins said this. He said, uh, 
I know we teach these are both the same place, but he said, did you ever stop thinking maybe that's the Jewish place in the Old Testament and that's the Gentile place in the Old Testament? They were both down, but they were two different compartments. See? Now you see, you see where he got that thing from? He didn't get that thing from the original Greek text. <laughs> he got that thing from believing what God said and studying what God said. God said, read it, study it, believe it, put it in practice. Let me tell you to go down the original languages. All right, down there with the dying thief. Now, how do you know that thing moved up there? Take your Bible and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, after the resurrection. You see, Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 is writing many years after the resurrection, maybe 15 years after the resurrection. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 and verse 2. It is thou expedient for me to glory. I'll come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. All right, I want a verse there that says he was caught up into paradise. What verse is that? 4, verse 4, caught up, in, then paradise isn't down here, it's up here. You know what that shows you? That showed it changed places. It was down here, now it's up here. Now, do you realize what a blessing that is? you realize that dying thief was saved by grace, through faith, in the finished work of Jesus Christ, and he wound up down there, but now that's up there. <laughs> so if you're saved by grace, through faith, in the finished work of Christ, you know where you wind up? You wind up there. All right, step over on this side here. I'll let this black figure represent an unsaved man. I hate to do that. But I mean, what are you going to do? I mean, make it yellow? <laughs> how, many ever, how many of you ever use a wordless book? Let me see your hand. A wordless book? Fewer people use them every year. A wordless book is just four or five little sheets of paper with nothing on them. You can lead people to Christ with that book. I heard these, these modern apostate fundamentalists say, well, the new ASB and the ASB are reliable because you can find all the fundamentals of faith in them, you know, you can lead people to Christ with them. Yeah, that's true, but that doesn't mean they're Bibles. You can find all the fundamentals of faith in a systematic theology book. That doesn't mean it's a Bible. I know you can lead a guy to Christ out of a Catholic Bible. I've done it. That doesn't mean it's a Bible. It just means it's got some of the Bible in it. <laughs> now, you take... You can lead a man to Christ with four sheets of paper. All you need is a little bit of white, a little bit of black, a little bit of red, and a little bit of gold. Now, if you want to go all the way, you put a little bit of green. You get your green piece of construction paper and talk about the Garden of Eden, and you put on a black sheet of paper and talk about sin coming in, and... Uh, Define a man, and you talk about the blood of Christ washing people, and they'll make you white as snow, and you go to a city that's out of pure gold when you die. You see? Now, folks say, Oh, well, I've never heard of such. Yeah, that thing works. I've seen it work. I'll tell you one of the most remarkable things I've ever seen in my life. I saw about 25 years ago up in Greenville. I had a guy working with me that was uh, just as unlike me as anybody you ever saw in your life. And I appreciated him. He, he was raised in a Christian home. And he must have gotten saved when he was six years old, never drank anything stronger than Coca-Cola all his life. And that fellow was raised in a Christian day school, in a Christian, you know, academy, and a Christian, he, I mean, you're just smooth and cheek like a little girl, you know, and kind of a sissified fella. But he wasn't a sissy, he had guts. Some of those fellows are fools, you know. Some of those soft-skinned fellows, they get inside that is like a lion. <laughs> and that fella, that fella, he was about 20 years old. And he used to always rejoice how he'd never lived the life of sin, what God had saved from. I'd rejoice that God had saved me from the mess I was in. And we got along real good. And one day I was out there in the street and saw him witness, and we were passing out tracks. Funniest thing you ever saw in your life, I saw four Marines. This was during the Korean days, about 51, 50. And these four Marines were, came up and stood by a bus stop all together. Huge fellows, strapping fellows, just bronze skin like leather boy. Left chest looked like an Army and Navy store. Stuff hanging all over there, you know. Stripes, hash marks all over the place. And this kid, he looked like a kid to me, looked like he was about 14, went across the street and took out this wordless book. And it was construction paper, about each sheet about six by ten. And he said, Now, men. <laughs> I could, I could have, I could have hit under a, a thimble, man. 
He said, I'm man, I want to tell you a story. <laughs> and I'm telling you, those four guys just <laughs> stood there, just hypnotized by that thing. And that guy took that green sheet and he said, now, once there was a man and a woman that lived in a beautiful garden and they had everything they wanted, you know, in those green garden. <laughs> <laughs> he went across that black page and then sin came in and we all have sin, haven't we? <laughs> you know. And I saw one of those guys, tears running down his face. Why do you think you were so in your life? He got through two of those guys trusted Christ and they missed the bus going by. I had to wait for the next bus. And two of them got saved right in the spot. Oh, and I'm going to paint him black. I represent an unsaved man. No, no prejudice. I got nothing against the color. See, I use it a lot. <laughs> but uh, what, what you going to do? I'm, you know, when I, when I was a boy, they said, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch it. You can't say that anymore. <laughs> I heard a fellow at the, at the ball, I heard some kid at the ball game say, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a tiger by the toe, you know. And I said, boy, that ain't the original version on that <laughs> thing right there you got. <laughs> And we had, a, we had a big old Brazil nut. We called it up. So, you know. But you can't do that anymore, you know. You can't say there's a in the wood pile. <laughs> I mean, you've got to say there's an Afro-American in the lumber yard, you know. Kind of <laughs> now, if some of your color friends get kind of upset with this, I mean, I know some jokes about white folks too, man. And they're funny too. And I know jokes about Baptist preachers that are funny. God Almighty have mercy and every day you can't, uh, can't appreciate a racial joke. I mean, race have characteristics that are funny. Right. You know, they say, uh, the Germans say about the Scotchmen, the reason why the, they're always marching and playing the bagpipes is because you can't hit a moving target. <laughs> <laughs> you know what they say about the German? They say every time a carpenter gets ready to build a baby carriage, it comes out a machine gun. <laughs> now, now, you know, you know, maybe if you're German, you don't appreciate that, but that's funny. That's funny. <laughs> Ah, it's funny. <laughs> I'll tell you a good joke about a Baptist. <laughs> this, uh, you've probably heard this before, but it's a good one. It's this Quaker got this cow, see. And every time he tries to milk this cow, this cow kicks over the bucket of milk. It hits him in the face with the tail. And finally this Quaker says to his cow, you know how the real ones talk, you know. O cow, thou knowest that I am a Quaker and cannot curse thee, but what thou dost not know is I can sell thee to a Baptist. <laughs> now, that's funny, see, because, uh, <laughs> because a lot of Baptists curse, you know that? Amen, amen. You don't think old Harry Truman, don't you? They call him Cousin Harry. He's a Baptist. All right, now that represents an unsaved fella. There he is. This represents a saved fella. What happens to him when they die? Well, take the unsaved fella. When he dies, he can't go to heaven. He isn't saved. He can't go to Abraham's bosom. It's empty. Can't go to purgatory. He isn't any purgatory. You know where he goes? He goes to hell. I believe that. I believe an unsaved man dies, goes to hell. I believe a fellow dies out of Christ, he goes, he burns. If you're in this building, you're unsaved, you're going to burn. I believe that. I think the main distinction today between the Christians whom God is using and those that just think God's using them is the fact that there's a division line now between the Christians where no matter how pious and slick and spiritual and smooth the one crowd gets, there's something they'll not do. They will not tell a fellow he's going to hell. And a Bible believer will tell him. Amen. We got a sissified Christianity. I believe they go to hell. If I didn't believe that, I'd quit preaching. Did you ever stop thinking what this thing is all about? What's it all about anyway? I mean, why get dressed up like this in monkey suit? If I, had, if I had my way, I'd put on blue denims and a sweatshirt and tennis shoes up here. Amen. And don't think I wouldn't because it would save my cleaning bill. <laughs> and I've been on platform where tennis shoes would keep you from breaking your neck and regular shoes you'd slip every time you moved. But you've got to put on a nice appearance. What for? You're trying to get people here. What's this building air condition for? How in the world did Wesley and Whitfield and all the rest of them survive while that air, air conditioning? <laughs> you realize that Wesley and Whitfield preach all through Georgia in the summertime with no air conditioning? Crowds of 10,000, 15,000 people? Outdoors? Not in the shade? What's the air conditioning for? You're trying to get people in here. What are the nice pews for? See the pretty rug? 
the electronic equipment. Do you ever stop and think what all this junk is for? I mean, what's all the expenditure for? You're trying to get people here. What are you trying to get them here for? You're trying to here to either get them saved or get them to go out and get other folks saved. And these spoiled, rotten Americans won't come into a building that isn't air conditioned. They're spoiled, rotten. Let me tell you something. If you went, if you went down where I live and put up a big tent out there in the richest section of town, a big tent out there, had a two-week meeting, you wouldn't preach to a corporal's guard. In that rich section, I know of at least 15 Christian families that are just as saved as anybody in the world, but they wouldn't be caught dead sitting in a tent. You know why? They're spoiled rotten. That's the problem. That's the problem. You know what we're trying to do? We're trying to get people saved. What's the big auditorium over there all that stuff for? You say, well, we can do without it. You, they won't come. I guarantee you they won't come. Unless you get a minimum expenditure, make it reasonably cool for them and reasonably warm for them in the winter and reasonably to park and reasonably, they will not come. Because they're just spoiled lousy. That's the problem. Now, you know what this stuff is spending for? We're trying to get people saved, keep them out of hell. Now, listen, if they don't go to hell, it's a waste of money. It's a waste of time. I wouldn't preach if I didn't believe people going to hell. I'd quit. But right this minute. These are ways to make a living than preaching. Folks all, oh, you preachers got it easy. Why don't you try it, son? Some of you fellas want to run a church all the time. Why don't you get in the pulpit and take a beating in front of the same crowd every week for 15 years and see how it goes. You think it's easy to stand where I'm standing and talk to the same crowd every Sunday for a year and talk about their sins? You think it's easy? Why don't you try it, kid? Oh, anybody get back room and work a thing out, you know, and pass this motion and do this motion, you know, and, and sign this and work this and get out in the congregation. How do you do? Stand up here. Amen. See? Amen. You can't stand up here without making enemies. If I don't make at least 15 good enemies before this meeting's over, I'll consider my time wasted. <laughs> That's right, brother. Some of you, for gonna be, some of you folk going to be so nervous you could thread a sewing machine while it's running before this thing's over. <laughs> That's right, man. Now, 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 what am I going through all that for if there's nothing to it? Listen, if there's no hell, us Bible believing preachers are the biggest fools that ever lived. What's the sense of antagonizing people and driving people and upsetting people if there's nothing to it? I, I, know, how to, I, know, I know there's an easy way to make a living at Brenda I know what to do. I know where to go and who to see and what to say. It's never been easy to do anything the right way. Like the Germans say, there must be a harder way to do it. <laughs> but you take, there's a way to contact the right people and set up the right setup with the right program so you can get through and come out smelling like a rose. Of course, if I tried, the Lord would kill me. <laughs> and when you get through, you'll have nothing when you get through. Being a missionary, there's an easy way to be a missionary. And there's a hard way. Be a pastor, there's a right way to be a pastor, and there's a wrong way to be a pastor. To be an evangelist, there's a way you can come smooth and clean and slick and polished with everything taken care of. And there's a way we're just like going down broken glass. I tell you, that there's, that there's an easy way to make a living preaching. I know because I've had my, I've been an apprentice electrician of Steamship Corporation, AF of L. Button and the whole works. I've been a D.I. in hand-to-hand -hand infantry, a radio announcer, a disc jockey, a cartoonist for a newspaper, a sign painter, ran a popcorn machine, played drum in a dance band. I know what's going on. Bartended on the beaches. I know what's going on. Easier way to make a living than preaching. I mean, worse come the worst, go back and join the army. <laughs> Dollar a day and the work ain't hard. Never hurry, never worry, never volunteer. Stay away from the oily room, keep your mouth shut. If it's moving, salute it. If it's lying down, pick it up. If you can't pick it up, paint it. <laughs> <laughs> fella dies, the fella dies, you know where he goes? He goes to hell. You know, sometimes we preachers, we talk like we don't, uh, hell isn't real to us. And I'm sure if it's more real to me, I'd preach different than what I do. There are time that's real to me and time that's not. We preachers, we get kind of professional, you know. I despise professionalism. You probably gather that by now. <laughs> I mean, if you see me just deliberately, just deliberately do something uncouth, and I'll, it's because I'm trying to drive home a point. I want to have you understand that I was a man 27 years before I was a preacher. And the thing I can't stand is that professionalism. Yeah, right. 
right, yeah. But you know, it's, you, you kind of get that way. You deal with so many people, you get hard. You get tough. I mean, you really do. Boy, I've, I, I've dealt with some guys. I just felt like saying, well, go to, you know, <laughs> I never have told a guy that. <laughs> I have never yet told an unsaved man to go to hell, but I felt like it. I felt like it, but go take you know. But you know, before you get saved, you tell a guy to go to hell, and he gets, uh, you know, he laughs at you, you know, before you, before you, before you save. But after you save, you tell a guy he's going to hell and try to keep him out, and he gets mad at you. <laughs> the strange thing is, I believe people go to hell. I believe if you die without Christ, you're going to go to hell. I'll tell you something else I believe. I believe when this meeting's over, when I've done my best, and all these preachers have done the best, and Brother Modlish has done his best, some of you will still go to hell. I believe there's some people silent or Bible-eating preachers for 50 years went to hell. I believe the South is filled with men about my age that can sing four stands of Just As I Am. They go to two to three revival meetings every year. They can tell you about the rapture. They can tell you about the Antichrist. And they're just as lost as a Madison Avenue executive in O'Keefe and O'Keefe Swamp. Those old boys bite you in the house. Well, preacher, sure glad to have you by. You know, ain't you going to stay a while? You're talking about the soul and heaven and hell. They know they're lost. They know they're going to burn. Well, I just ain't quite ready. Well, what's your hurry? You like, you like having another cup of coffee? It's all over the south are like that. I'll be going to say, man, he dies, goes to hell and burns. I wish I could always get upset about it. But I, sometimes I don't. I had a meeting one time down in South Carolina. I got real upset. It was a bad meeting. Nobody saved. And I was mad with the Lord about something. And I got back here in the back room. I was the only person praying. Nobody in the church come back and pray. And I threw my Bible clear across the room one night. I mean, Pete Ruffin throws his Bible across the room. You know, things are getting bad. <laughs> and I threw that thing down there, and I was down there feeling sorry for myself, you know. And about that time, I felt a kind of a presence in the room. And I looked up, and there were three teenagers sitting there. A kid about 19, two girls about 17, just sitting there with their heads down. And I said, what do you want? And they said, we want to get saved. And I said, uh, well, why didn't you come in the invitation? And the boy said, I don't know, but we're coming now. And I said, what made you decide to come? And that kid looked at me, I never will forget him. He looked at me and he said, well, he said, you cried for us and we couldn't cry for ourselves. I wish I could always weep over sinners. And sometimes I do. But sometimes I don't. Amen. Sometimes I don't. You get tough. You know what I'm reminded of? I remind of a troop ship that went overseas in, last, in the last war, World War II, and some chaplain got up there in the forward hatch and going to give a little devotional, you know, before they hit the beaches. <laughs> and one of those old hillbillies down forward deck said, Before you go preaching to us, preacher, let me ask you one question. The chaplain said, What is that? And the hillbilly said, Does you believe there's a hell or don't you? And the chaplain said, Of course I don't. I'm a 20th century enlightened man. And the hillbilly said, We don't want to hear you preach then. And the chaplain said, why not? And the hillbilly said, because if there's a hell, you lying. We don't want to hear no liar preach. And he said, if there ain't no hell, what do we need you preaching us for anyway? <laughs> that's, that's profound, man. That's profound. I heard another one one time. I, I was at a meeting one time, and it was a Southern Baptist uh, cooperative campaign in the spring, you know, simultaneous, you know, them things. And uh, we used to have those all the time, you know. I'm an ordained Southern Baptist minister. I didn't think you knew there was a traitor in the camp. <laughs> I'm an ordained Southern Baptist minister, man. My church the largest in the association. My pastor was moderator when I was ordained. They just disowned me. I didn't leave them, man. They left me. I just, I just kept on preaching when I'm preaching. The invitation got fewer and fewer, and pretty soon they quit. <laughs> And one night I was, I was the big old simultaneous campaign there. We were all there with our song leaders, you know, and a fellowship breakfast and all that jazz. And pretty soon a guy got up at the head of the table, young fella. And he was a good fella. I used to Syria, but kind of naive, you know, kind of green around the gills. And he got up and he said this. He said, and serious, just as serious a heart attack. And he got up there and he said, brethren, he said, uh, there's something I can't understand. Maybe you give me some light on. And he said, I preach about uh, hell in my church every couple of months. And he said, and I've read the New Testament through five times in Greek. Of course, he had to let you know that, you know. And he said, I can't find where the doctrine of hell is done away in the New Testament. But he said, every time I preach about hell, some of my very best members get so upset. He said, why is that? And he was really sincere. And one old hillbilly preacher from way up in Sand Pit, Alabama or someplace up there raised his hand and said, well, preacher, he said, you wouldn't want nobody talking about your home that way, would you? <laughs> oh, I tell you, I never will forget that. 
I thought to myself, boy, that's profound. You know that? I mean, whenever you hear a preacher redecorating hell, it's because he's about to move in. Amen, brother. Amen. Amen. All right, the fellow dies. He goes to hell. The saved fellow dies. Where does he go? He can't go to hell. He's saved. Amen. He can't go to Abraham's bosom. It's empty. He can't go to purgatory. Because it ain't purgatory. You know where he goes? Absent the body, present with the Lord. For to me to depart and be with Christ is far better. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And Paul says, I am in a straight for tricks too, having a desire to depart and be with Christ. Listen, listen, listen. Which is far better. Not just good. Not just better. Far better. Every Christian is better off dead than alive. <laughs> I've always thought Paul was kind of a suicidal maniac. I've always have thought that. I might be wrong, and Lord correct me, but I've always thought he had uh, uh, suicidal tendencies. Did you ever read 2 Corinthians 11? You realize that no man could live like that if he was trying to be careful? <laughs> I mean, that guy wasn't trying to be careful. I read one time, I read one time in, in Acts chapter 14 someplace where he went into town and preached and when he got out they stoned him and left him for dead. And I read on down there and it said, but while they stood around, Paul rose up and went back into the city. <laughs> Isn't that weird? That's just where they like to kill him back in the city. And I didn't understand that for a while and then one day I got reading 2 Corinthians 12. And he said about 14 years ago, and I got figuring that thing out there, it came out pretty close. And he said he was caught up to heaven and saw things and heard things a man couldn't speak. And I said to him, I know what happened. That bird got a vision of where he was going. He decided to go back down and take a shortcut. <laughs> I mean, he got up there and saw that thing, and he said, wow, look at that, look at that, wow. Hey, Steve! <laughs> Stephen, glory up there. That's the guy he consented to his death, waving at him. You know, no crepe on the door, no sin, no garbage, no census, no H E W, <laughs> no OSHA, no taxes, <laughs> no draft. <laughs> Boy, it sure is good to be home, Lord. <laughs> You're not home yet. You got to go back down. You're kidding. <laughs> no, you got to abide in the flesh to bear fruit. Well, now let's let's make an arrangement here, Lord. <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean. How about uh, two months? Two months? No, nope. back down. Two weeks? Two weeks? Back down. Uh, Lord, how about get out for a kick you out? <laughs> and the old boy opens his eyes, and there he is lying down there with bruises all over his back, all over his face, blood dripping from a couple of bones busted. The old boy gets up there, and there's that hot Syrian sun. He smells that dirty camel standing next to him. And there's that dusty road, and all those people standing around there looking at him, you know, and they're all dying too. Now, what would you do? I think he was trying to run out in front of a car and get hit. <laughs> you know, uh, if I offered you a million dollars, I mean, really, really, truly, if I offered you a million dollars and didn't tell you about this, I'd sell you out short. Some of you folks up in years now, do you ever count, do you ever count, do you ever had to stand it up? Now, you know what's going to happen to you, don't you, if the Lord tires, don't you? Kids are going to fight over your money. That's right. You're going to be sick, lying around. They're going to, you know, oh, my poor daddy. And I hope he kicks off pretty quick. <laughs> you know, some of them. Oh, yeah, man. And the lawyers and doctors will be waiting around. They'll take you down to the hospital and push down a little dinky sheet, you know, a little dinky linen thing they put on you, you know. Boy, you know something? If you don't have this thing here, you miss the whole thing. And if you've got this thing here, there ain't much left to it anyway. You take Howard Hughes and Getty and those guys, they don't get a hole in the ground any bigger than I do. And if they do, they don't fill up any more than I'm going to fill up mine. <laughs> I mean, one day they're going to take your old naked body. Some are going to undress you. Some of you have been dressed and undressing yourself for 60 years. You ever start thinking about this someday? Somebody else is going to take your clothes off you? Down there in the morgue, put you up against the wall, wash your dead body. Slam those things under your arm, pitch clean your legs, and suck all your butt out, and squirt you full of junk, push you in a box, and bury you. Amen. 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 Uh, that's what's going to happen. Now you know something. If I offered you a million dollars and didn't tell you about this, I'd be I'd be betraying you. This this is the thing, man. This is the thing. 
I mean, you get down there, all you got just a linen sheet and your kids fighting over your money, what, what difference does the rest make? Uh, down there in Pensacola, Florida, we had an old boy down there named Duck, Ernest Duck. And his daddy was a Methodist preacher. And when his daddy got to be about 80, he was wasting away in a wheelchair and dying. And every day he thought he was going to die. And they called the doctor and keep him going a little bit longer. And one day they're out there behind the house in the garden, a black-eyed pea patch out there. He's under a mimosa tree, just looking out across the pea patch. And he turned to Ernest and he said, uh, I'm going to leave you today, son. And the boy said, I'll get the doctor, Daddy. And the old man said, no, you just get that doctor today. I'm going today. I'm really going this time. And he said, well, Daddy, you said that before. So went and got the doctor, and the doctor came here and gave him some pills and shot and sat around there and talked a while. And after about 15 minutes, old man Duck looked out across that garden, and he said, my, that sure is a pretty room. That's the most beautiful room I've ever seen in all my life. I never did see a room like that. And then a kind of funny look came across his face, and he turned to Ernest, and he said, What made me say that? And Ernest said, I don't know, Daddy. And about a minute later, that old man looked at the doctor, he looked at his son, and then he said, Well, bye-bye. <laughs> and he was gone. <laughs> now, brother, you can't beat that with a stick, man. Now, that's the way to go. We had a little boy down there named Schaefer. He was married to one woman for 65 years. He ought to have got a purple heart or something. <laughs> and you take that guy, I don't know what, I guess, I guess, uh, I guess for 50 years is a golden or whatever it is, 65 must be a uranium or something, you know. But that old man, he was in perfect health when he died. And after a big Sunday dinner, he got up from the table and went in and lay down on the sofa. And a couple of times he called his wife and said, honey, he said, I don't know what's wrong with me. I just feel so good. I just feel so funny. I feel so happy. I know what's wrong with me. I feel like laughing. He said, I don't understand what it is. I just felt so happy all my life. Amen. And he closed his eyes, and three and a half minutes he was dead. Wow, now listen, there are harder ways to go than that, boys and girls. Amen. That old thing lying around there with that cancer in your face, 10, 11 months at a time, all that junk, and not know where you're going when you die. Some of you say people better start having pity on these unsaved people. They got all the problems you got and hell on top of it. I, 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 I was up in Carolina one time, and uh, there was a woman up there dying of cancer. She was an old saint. Everybody knew it. She had a reputation. Lived for the Lord for years and years. Raised kids who were preachers and evangelists, that kind of thing. She must have been about 95. And she had an open cancer on her face about the size of a silver dollar. You could smell it when you came in the house. And I, I had a lot of time to think working up in North Carolina. And I saw something. I saw the reason why there's so many infidels in America is because they never seen anybody die that wasn't on drugs. Now you take, you know, you know these days why you never see anybody go to hell? They're all doped up when they go. I bet if you could see a fellow step out of his skin and step into hell, you do a lot for your religion. Now, I'm not advocating, you know, getting rid of all the painkillers. I know you can't do that. I'm just telling you what's going on. And I got up there, and that old saint been back there suffering that bed for about 11 months. And they asked me to go in there and pray for her. And I went in there. And I remember opening that door and stepping in there. And when I stepped in there, I felt a compulsion to get on my knees. And I got on my knees, and I went around the bedside, crawled around beside the bed, and, and I was going to, you know, reach up and pray for her, but instead of reach up, my hand got her hand like this and began to pray. I must have prayed 30 minutes. And I'll tell you, as God is my witness, I couldn't lift up my head in that room. I couldn't get my head up. There was a presence in that room. He said, well, if you looked up, you reckon you've seen anything? I don't know. I never looked up to see if I'd see anything. <laughs> I just knelt there and prayed. And boy, you talk about getting in between the cherubims and the mercy seat. My, 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 man. There was something in that room, boy. And I'll tell you, it wasn't the devil. I mean, it was like, holy, 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 boy, keep your head down. Keep your eyes shut. And I kept my head down, kept my eyes shut. Let me tell you something. That old sister died. There wasn't anybody within 100 miles that was guessing by where she went. Absent the body, present with the Lord. All right, what's going to happen? Well, one day the Lord himself should ascend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. 
or someday Christ is coming and when he comes the dead in Christ the bodies that are asleep come up and the souls are already up there because the Bible says Christ died for us that whether we wake or sleep we should live together with him alive or dead you are with Christ even though listen even those asleep in Jesus Christ will God bring with him with him with him they're up there with him now all right, then we go up and get our new bodies. Come back, reign with the Lord on this earth a thousand years. Then what happens? Well, John says, I saw a great white throne of him that sat upon it, from whose face the heaven and earth fled away, and there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things written in the books, and man according to his works. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and they were cast the lake of fire. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now what happened? The Lord took all these saved people in paradise and took them out and put them into heaven. And one day he'll take all these lost people out of hell and put them in the lake of fire. They have an expression for that out in the world. They say, out of the frying pan into the fire. That's the expression. You know what the Lord does? He keeps them down here till the atonement is complete and puts them up there. He keeps them down here till judgment is complete and then puts them down there. I hear folks say, well, I think God just too good to send by to hell. He should have give everybody a second chance. Yes, he will. That'll be your second chance right there. If you want to take that chance, take that chance. Me, count me out. Count me out. I profess to have better sense than that. I'm not about to take my chances with, at the white throne judgment, no matter what. I'll take my chances right there. Amen. Right there. You want your chance at the white throne judgment? You get out there, a light you can't look at, a voice make your ears ring, you look under your feet, there's nothing under your feet. That judgment doesn't take place on earth. The earth is gone. That fellow's standing in outer space. Nothing under his feet. Looks up, can't face it, looks back down. Oh my God, 15 million light years of space under your feet and something holding you up. What's holding you up? That's the question. The Bible says all things are held together by the word of his power. And there you are, stand there. Some of you characters, for the first time in your life, the thought will pierce your soul. Why? The only thing that's holding me up is God. I mean, gravity will be out of style. <laughs> now, look here. I don't have to learn that lesson, see? You know why I'm standing here? Because God is holding me up. You know why I'm not flat my face? Because the Lord hasn't dropped me yet. If the Lord wants to touch my heart, touch my lungs, whoop, I'm over, brother. I don't have to stand out there to know God's holding me up. I know what's holding me up. And it's not my metabolism or my physical condition, it's the Lord. Amen. And when the Lord says go, I go. If I hit this floor right now, heart attack, blood got, stroke, you know, left arm going up on you, a pain going through your chest, you know. You folks will be running up here, you know, give them air, get the water, call the doctor, you know, and whoop, 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 this thing start down here to pick me up, you know. I get out of my body and say, hey, cool it, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm all right. <laughs> Back off. I'm okay. You wouldn't hear a word I was saying. <laughs> and about that time, two young gentlemen, say about 33 and a half years old, without wings, would show up and say, you ready to go? I said, I've been ready for 31 years. Off we go, man. Off we go. Now, if you got that, what difference does the rest of it make? All right, let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, bless the message this morning. If there's any unsafe person here, I pray they'll take heed and take warning and do what they ought to do, what they should have done a long time ago, and just put their faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. May they trust the blood atonement for sinners and Calvary's cross to pay their sin debt. May they go out of here rejoicing. It's finished, it's past, it's done, it's over, and nothing but glory in heaven ahead. Lord, if some unsaved person came here this morning, maybe not in this morning crowd, but there might be, might be, some person here had been trusting their repentance or trusting their tears or trusting their feelings or trusting their prayers to save them, help them to place their faith in the blood of the Lamb this morning. Now, us men head bowed and eyes closed here a few minutes before we leave. We're not going to have an invitation this morning. I'm not going to ask anybody forward.
before we go here this morning. If you're here today and you have any doubts about your salvation, I'll give you the best advice you ever had in your life. And I won't blush to say I'm going to give it to you. Uh, my conscience is just as pure as snow about it. I'll give you the best advice you ever had in your life. Quit trusting your righteousness and quit trusting your religion and trust Jesus Christ. That's the best advice anybody will ever give you. Your religion can't get you through. Your righteousness can't get you through. But the Lord Jesus Christ can get you through. Lord, help them to see it. Help them to believe it. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. Brother Modelish, come ahead.